So we're officially now starting. Uh, I'd like to first say thanks to everyone. I guess that it's a new, different and unique way to do Data Plus Women. Uh, first time that we're doing it virtually, uh, quite different from what we have usually, that we have kind of uh, some social when we start and we can talk to each other. Uh, today, we are here, everyone in front of the screen, the same place that we've been all day. So yeah, thanks everyone for staying for a Friday after work with us. Uh, I hope that you have your drinks uh, with you. For those that are new to, to Data Plus Women, uh, welcome. Uh, we're a group, we're in different countries. Uh, this one is the Dutch chapter of Data Plus Women. And basically we're a network where you see men, women, it doesn't matter, everyone. And the idea here is uh, to create this network and a space uh, to learn new skills, uh, to discuss topics, uh, and of course, to talk about data. For those that are not new, that have been in our usual uh, events where we usually go to a space, to a place and say hello to each other, uh, welcome back. Uh, I hope to see everyone soon uh, in the real world. Um, and before we start, in just a few housekeeping instructions. If you would like to, to wait during the event, you can use hashtag data plus women. You're more than welcome to do it. Uh, if you would like to ask questions or comment, you see that uh, in the bottom of your screen, there are the two options. There is the question and answer option, and there is the comment option. So if you'd like to send questions, please use QA, uh, because this way we can filter it easily. We will see what you're what is your intention in an easy way. Um, so this is Data Plus Women uh, here in the Netherlands. I will ask each one of the ladies that are in this uh, screen to unmute themselves. And since we're talking about today, we're talking about uh, mental health, well-being, and how we've been doing during quarantine. Uh, I will ask them to say hi and tell one positive and one negative thing that they experienced during the past uh, stay at home months. So it's starting by Aline, please. If Aline, you're around, right? I can see. Yes. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, glad to be with you um, this afternoon. Um, positive thing about doing the lockdown. It's, uh, yes, in fact, I started running again after a huge break of seven years. So, <laughs> Good news, um, but uh, I don't really like homeschooling my kids. I'm not a good youth, so I won't miss uh, <laughs> that part. I knew that you would talk about your school, and I have uh, something for you later today. Uh, so, Amanda, if you could ah. unmute yourself. Oh wait, am I? No, you're you're already unmuted. Sorry. Oh, perfect. perfect. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay. Yes. Hello. I'm Amanda. Um, okay. A positive. Okay. I'm going to start with a positive thing from the, uh, from, from this quarantine. Um, I think I have done a really great, or I've been really happy to, um, to foster friendships with people that I might not necessarily have had super close friendships with before. Uh, which I think is fantastic. Um, negative. Oh, um, I think negative for me is spending a, way too much time in my own house with myself. The, yeah, it, it's, it's driving me a little crazy and I'm super happy that things are opening up again now. That's good. So carry on. Next one, Emma. Hi, everybody. Very nice to be able to participate in this online. Um, I would say like my positive and my negative are the two faces of the same coin. Um, working remote, so working at home allows me to be in my bubble, which is good if I need to concentrate because my productivity is much better lately. But at the same time, being in my own bubble uh, makes me miss a lot, like coffee breaks with my colleagues or just having the possibility to have a quick chat and uh, have face-to-face -face communication. 
So yeah, two sides of the same coin. Okay, thanks Emma and Marie's your positive and negative points. Let me unmute myself. Hey, um, positive and negative. Um, of course, I don't like change, just like everybody else. Uh, I will admit it. Um, but when I stayed at home, at some point, I realized that I actually like to be at home. I like to not travel. I like to spend my um, time not with traveling, but for example, now I started to do yoga every day or almost every day. Uh, I see a lot of progress in that. It keeps my mind uh, very relaxed. I really like that. Um, I can sit outside in my lunch break. I can wear my flip-flops the whole day. I just feel more at ease and this also impacts my work. Negative side is indeed I sleep, uh, I uh, work and I do yoga in this room I'm in. So at some point it's a bit of a bubble and then hard to break out. So that's it for me actually. Okay, thank you, Maurice, and thank you, everyone. So now I guess that you all have a different perspective from the organizers. Uh, if you'd like to stay in contact, you still see in our uh, Twitters. And if you'd like kind of uh, to help us with our negative and positive things that we said, also feel free to contact us. I will add my positive and negative ones also. Uh, so I guess that... Uh, I will start by the negative because the positive is quite good and I would like to end with it. So negative is that I'm definitely not a hummy, hummy person. I don't like to stay at home all day. It makes me crazy. <laughs> and positive one is that it, I definitely managed to get super focused and run my first 21st kilometers during lockdown. And I managed even to join a virtual race. So yeah, I'm very proud of it. I run in a place that I've never been to. I received one day a medal from a place that I've never been to. So it's, it's quite funny. Um, so yeah, this is my positive and negative. Uh, for those that would like to see us again and keep in contact, I'm keeping, uh, showing here how you can contact Data Plus Women or a chapter or that chapter. So uh, you can find us in our page, uh, Twitter or Meetup, feel free. Um, and about today, so we'll be, as we, we talked, we'll be talking about well-being uh, and mental health. We have aimed to start, then after we have Kiona, they will bring different perspectives to this discussion. Uh, Amy will, will start with a, a more interview style. Uh, she will answer questions about uh, well-being and how to deal with this moment. Uh, Kiona will bring a bit uh, her perspective in studying and research and mental health uh, in the digital and the digital world. Um, and in the end, we are planning a meditation session, five minutes, just to everyone kind of uh, relax and go to the Friday. That uh, I guess that for a lot of us is still at home. Um, but before uh, starting with the uh, aim, I would like to do a bit of now. We, I asked the organizers to, to tell how they're feeling, but I'd like to ask this for everyone that is around. How are you doing? So how are you feeling? Are you kind of a super happy? It's kind of a perfect life. You actually love social distance. Uh, you're hating this experience uh, and kind of a, you can see the day that you can do everything back or you're kind of just kind of a coping with the moment. Uh, so to know, to, to, to have this idea, of course, we cannot unmute everyone, but of course we can do a quiz. That is another thing that a lot of you have been doing a lot during this period of lockdown, I'm sure. Uh, but at, at this time, don't worry, there is no right and wrong answer. Uh, you can use the image or let me do one thing here. I will share this also with you all. Mm. Now I'm seeing that I cannot see the comments. So if one of the organizers can see the comments and please share this link so people can easily find it, do it, please. Because I can see just question and answers. 
the comments disappeared for me. And I will now change here because I will start the question. So uh, if everyone is already in the, in the poll, let me start it. Okay, so first question. I hope that you, you managed to get the, the poll right. Uh, da, 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 da. I can see, I can see answers coming, and I will just answer a question to Emma. Okay, they answered themselves. Thanks, Marie. So, okay, I see that people are feeling today between kind of okay and cool. Good that we don't have a lot of people under the weather, right? So that's fine. I guess that majority is feeling cool. So good. So next question for you all people. Uh, the thing that you're missing most in this new normal, that is the expression that we've been kind of uh, hearing a lot recently. Um, so what are you missing? What is the thing that you're really, really kind of, oh, I, I wish I could do it. And good news, you can mark more than one answer in this one because I was quite generous. So yeah, I allowed you to kind of get crazy and mark a lot of answers. So friends, so oh, this is beautiful. Cute people, everyone is missing the friends. Okay, I guess that we have a winner. Friends are the things that people are missing most. So going to our next question. Social distance for you. What is the meaning of social distance for you? It, is it just boring? Is it a long queue to enter the supermarket? Is it the perfect way to interact with humans because you think that you don't need to get near humans? You're fine. Is it the best excuse you found to install a dating app? Or is it not enough to keep your inner space, you need more space. It's something like one and a half meters. It's not enough. You need at least five meters to be happy and, and live your, your life. So I guess that in this one, you can, you can also have more than one option if I'm not wrong. So, okay, you can see that everyone is going to the supermarket. I agree with you all. Yes, social distance for me, it's been translated with the uh, by a, a big queue to enter the supermarket also. So last question of the day before going to our presenters for everyone. Lockdown turned you into, and now I know Aline's answer already. So since lockdown, what you've been doing? What is new in your, in your life? Are you now an artisan baker? I know a lot of people that now are, do, are making breads. Uh, are you now a professional cleaner, kind of uh, cleaning the house every day, three times a day? Are you a crazy person? That is a very, very important thing. Are you now a Zen master? It doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be the tableau title. It can be just in yoga. Um, or are you a kid's teacher like Alini that I now is kind of an expert in, in teaching kids and uh, doing homework with them? So I can see that we have a lot of Zen masters here. We will need to start to give titles to everyone. That's so interesting. You guys have all been super productive. I definitely went for crazy person. <laughs> That's definitely what I became. Well, if you do everything, you, you become a crazy person anyway. So it's fine. So yeah, I guess that, oh, it's still people coming in. It, was it the, an artisan baker that uh, kind of uh, added a vote or it's my impression or is it, it's only me getting crazy? It's okay. I guess that we have here an idea about what's happening. So we have people missing friends, uh, looking at social distance as a big queue in the supermarket uh, and a lot of Zen masters that we don't know exactly if they are in yoga or tableau or both, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so going back to what we came here for, right? I will now 
Cole Maris that will be our panelist and Cole aim to start the first presentation that will be about well-being and aim will explain us what is flowing hack and what a flow hack does. So Maris and aim now up to you both. I will stop sharing so you have a Thank you. Uh, well, now, Amy, thank you again and uh, welcome uh, for being in this edition and to share your light about um, yeah, what you do. And um, I saw something in the title about being a flow hacker. So I'm also really interested about that. So uh, yeah, so I'm curious, uh, how does a day for you, how does it look like being a flow hacker? And I have to also introduce our link. The yoga I follow is with Amy every day. So that's uh, what I know. So I'm very interested in the, the other parts. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. It's really great and the most uh, auspicious time to actually be here with everything going on in our current events across the world. I think it couldn't have been a more appropriate session to have and bring forth and try not to hit the hard alcohol right away. Let's just try not to hit the hard alcohol. No, we may have it under the desk. Um, but this is a great question in terms of yoga technology and flow hacking, mainly because most of even the answers that were given against the data polls, as I took some just notes, just real quick words, it's very present and obvious that the choices that we make are being made not because we want to necessarily do them, but because our subconscious is actually leaning us that way. Like it, it's, it's basically our subconscious that's driving us in that direction. And what I perceive as a flow hacker and how I interpret it, having worked with and having trained with some flow hackers it's been very interesting that you use those tools in your toolkit that makes you really good at what you do for work or what makes you really good at, at the things you love. And then you hack your own flow state by state by doing those things even more and by being in action. So it could be an example of a flow state could be the fact that when I was consulting in the United States and in Canada, I was traveling five days a week uh, for pretty much 15 years, Monday through Thursday on a plane, Accenture, Deloitte, IBM. So one of the things I used to do is pack my car trunk with my yoga mat, with my yoga gear. I'd go to the office at the client site for, at seven o'clock. I'd get my work done. I'd have my coffee, but I knew at 6.30, I would bounce into my car. I'd drop into the class. I would train as I'm driving back from the hotel. I would call up the hotel room service and have them drop me a salad, grilled chicken, and a large bottle of water. So when I got to the hotel, I had my dinner and then rinse and repeat. But what I did is I leveraged the whole component of bringing them all together. And that's and how... That would be my next question indeed. Do you see that something separate or, or does it really relate to each other in some way? No, they relate, to each, part. they relate to each other because even as a, as a data analytics person, as a SQL DBA, part of understanding the data is seeing patterns before anyone else does. Yeah. That's, it's about seeing patterns in the data that the naked eye or the untrained eye can't see, but the trained eye can. Same thing with going to yoga. Same thing with being able to prepare for that. This is laughing because we know how that is. Yes. We sometimes don't know and can't see what we don't know until because it sits in a blind spot. So in some ways, flow hacking is going deep into the blind spot, even though it's uncomfortable. It's not comfortable. I'll give you that much. It's never comfortable. If, you're, if it's comfortable, you're not in a flow state because flow state allows you to get into the uncomfortable and transform it to be more present in that experience as opposed to expecting it to be comfortable instead of manageable. Like I think it was Amanda who said homeschooling was a bit of a challenge. I get that. But by hacking the flow state would be finding an opportunity that you gained out of that and embarking more on that perception versus the in language, oh, I'm frustrated. This is not my thing. Because you could probably be really, really good at it. 
And that language has to be transformed because then it just doesn't show up in the space as a transformation. It shows up as more negativity. Okay. Uh, I heard you also saying about, indeed, about the change in the routine. Um, uh, for example, now you picked the example of Aline and we all shared about how our routines changed a little bit. Um, uh, what do you actually think uh, the one element that is collectively uh, scaring us the most at the time, at this time? Well, it's great that this is the Dutch branch of Data Plus Women, because I would probably say it's the losing control, the lack of certainty. We are completely unfolding into the blackness of uncertainty, hard stop. It, we don't know what's gonna happen. We have no clue. And people could try and force the old, the old way of being into the new norm, but it's not gonna work. Yes. It's not gonna work because the navigation is different now. I think yeah. there was a gentleman in California in Silicon Valley that had stated, it was, I think it was a gentleman who ran for office in the US, I think Andrew Chan or something like that. He stated that the amount of change that we were looking to disrupt would not happen for at least 10 years. But COVID has impacted that change to happen in three months. Now look at that, three months. That means we are not going back to the way we were before. It's not, but people will be resistant because of the inability to control because they're afraid, fearful of what's on the other side of that. Do you think that, is, that has something to do with being vulnerable to uh, let go the control to, to show that or? It's a, it's a great, it's a great place. I'd probably say it's vulnerability and courageousness and bravery because at the end of the day, I mean, you have Brene Brown, who's a social scientist. She's one of my favorite authors. She's one of my favorite speakers. Braving the Wilderness is an excellent book. I've read it three or four times. Braving the Wilderness means you're not going to have people that understand you a lot. You may be out there in the cold by yourself for a little while, but you will find people that will align with you. But the challenge comes is that people get very f afraid of not being liked or not looking good or not fitting into society or not going with the clique. It's like peer pressure, it's do no mal, status quo. Come on, let's be realistic. That is in essence what we're talking about. To be vulnerable and to be courageous means you're not fragile. You're not fragile, you're not gonna break. Fragility is different. That's like if I have a glass, it's fine china, and it's gonna break, that's fragility. When yeah. you're talking about vulnerability, it has to do with your coping mechanisms and your coping skills. And this whole hashtag Black Lives Matter and black hashtag BLM and hashtag um, amplify melanated voices is so important because melanated voices don't always sound good to the ear. They don't, not for the normal person, not for your normal person who's grown up with privilege. It doesn't show up for them because it sounds like it's grading on a, on a board but it's really not. Mm -hmm. It's just years and decades of constantly coping through society's expectation and norms when that isn't us. Whether you're French, Spanish, African, Greek, Italian, Serbian, Russian, Romanian, I've worked in five continents. To be culturally and socially intelligent requires there to be diversity, inclusion, and ethics woven into the conversation. But if we get scared, we may not share it. And that's really where the vulnerability is there and it's okay to be vulnerable. But I think there's now's the opportunity to have those conversations about vulnerability because no yeah. one's gonna bite you. No one's gonna hit you. No one's gonna yell at you. Just know that everyone speaks with a different tone, a different background, and it doesn't mean that they want to hurt you. It doesn't mean that you got to be scared of them. It doesn't mean that they're trying to bully you. It just means that they're speaking to you and all that they know and all that they've learned. Yes, and I'm thinking about the workplace because data is usually really technical, can be maybe like a hard environment, so to say. Agreed. Um, like, because this is data plus women, being a woman, do you think it's, like hard to be vulnerable. Um, if I would cry, would that make me weak? Um, 
What's your this opinion is, about that? I mean, this is two sides of the same coin, Marisa. This is two yeah. sides of the same coin because vulnerability and, and fragility, by definition, by Merriam Webster, for someone who contextually didn't grow up speaking the English language by native tongue, fragility and vulnerability are defined very differently. And I actually had copied it down because I literally wanted to share the definition of what it means to be vulnerable. To be vulnerable implies that one who is vulnerable is weak without protection, with that result that they're easily hurt physically or emotionally. What that in essence means as a technologist myself and as a senior consultant, you need to have a tough skin. It doesn't mean I'm any less than a woman. It means that I have to work at developing my emotional strength and my, my backbone to be able to navigate these conversations, which can trigger me because in reality, we have misogyny in, a, in the patriarchy in a lot of these workplaces. So of course it's gonna trigger some woman who's sensitive, of course. There's nothing wrong with that, but to navigate it means to put yourself into those uncomfortable positions and train the muscle. But if we keep on holding like, oh, no, I can't. Oh, no, mm, mm, mm. not going to say anything. That's doing yeah. us as women a disservice. Okay, I get it. It's, uh, it's about speaking up and showing your vulnerability, but uh, also continuing. Being brave. Being brave. Being brave. Being brave and courageous, yes. That's, yeah, uh, it's being brave and courageous right. because there are two yeah. sides of the coin, right? Yes. Um, so... I was thinking we, of course, we talked about COVID and the health crisis and economic crisis. And since you're, of course, my yoga teacher, is it like <laughs> possible to do like a yin yang exercise here? Like, can we change uh, lenses and find opportunities to grow in moments like this? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you navigate that again by training the muscle, you know, People would look at me and maybe judge me and be like, oh my God, she's so excitable. She's so loud. She's so present. She, I, could, I could go through the myriad of the things that I've heard being bullied all over the world for being an outspoken Latina. So I'm just being transparent. However, it has developed my muscle of coping. And also as a data analyst, as a SQL DBA, also having worked in the fashion industry, this has enabled me to be successful in my forecasting ability for global fashion brands because I'm observing consumer behavior as well. So not just training that muscle, but that also teaches us as data analysts, as data lovers, as data junkies, how to flip the script on that data and look deeper beneath the data of where it's coming from. And then you can make these great analysis off this data from any which direction you're coming in. So the yin yang exercise is basically saying, how could you turn that negative into an opportunity for growth? Yes. And I think that's for everyone to see and to look what's around it and what you can change and what you can do. So maybe it's not an easy question to answer for everybody. But just look around, yeah. see what's there. And, and it does take falling on your face a lot of times it does it takes falling down a lot and to there's too much of a looking good culture that people grow up and are raised with a belief system that they can't fail or that they can't make a mistake for the love yep. of god make as many as you want that's how you learn but now let's be realistic you're not going to make the same mistake 50 times because if not i'm going to have a word with you as a manager because then i'm going to wonder what's wrong here you got to give yeah, someone an opportunity yeah. to make some mistakes but then you gotta be like whoa, 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 whoa. what else is deeper here that you're making the mistake like 20 times versus three do you have a comprehension yeah. situation so actually what you're saying be on the court play fall down get up again and just totally. be there uh, great. Like the homeschooling. I don't think it was Amanda. I think it was Aline with the homeschooling. Aline. Who was homeschooling? Aline? Great. It's, it's the same thing. It's like, great, it might not be the most exciting thing for us to do, but I'm almost positive you could slip some whiskey in your coffee or some like something in your coffee and it'll be even more exciting. But diffuse it with humor because at the yeah. end of the day, we all, we're all one foot in the grave 
and the other one waiting for the banana peel. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. I like it. It's an interesting one. And I'm also thinking, um, how do you think that, um, I'm thinking of my mom because before this, a year ago, she asked me, how do I turn on my computer? I have shown her like many times before. Like, this is the button, you just do it. You, you do you. Uh, she's a primary school teacher, so she doesn't need a computer. Not needed at all. Since two months, she has her own YouTube channel with, I think, 60 videos. She shares them with the kids. It's, it's amazing. I, I really like it. I'm, I'm super proud and I actually want to share it with everybody, but I don't want to be that girl. And how, how do you, this is just one example, but how do you think technology can help us stay and connect, uh, like strong and resilient? Well, there's, it's a combination of, of being able to identify what technology works for you that you don't feel uncomfortable with, but that you could learn from and also to get out of your own way. So there's something that happens when we're in a state of high beta, high arousal, when we have amygdala attacks, there's something that happens to us as human condition, right? We get freaked out and we start to beat ourselves up that we can't do this or, oh my God, it's so scary. But the reality is your mom's older and she managed to kill it. And now she's probably got more videos out than I do. I give her a lot of props. But the thing is, is that Technology is to be used for good, not evil. However, not everyone will jump straight into putting all their vulnerable information and content inside the space of technology right away. And, you know, I, I see this because there's a wonderful number of um, startups in California and New York City, I'm sure in Europe as well, that are, that are weaving in the whole mental health awareness component into the apps that they're developing, like Headspace, like the meditation apps, like um, HeartMath for HRV, um, like my ring, which this ring is Aura, and this keeps track of my sleep biometrics. I thought I was cool with my Fitbit. But this you is were. like next level <laughs> biometrics from California. It tracks my sleep. It tracks my heat temperature at night when I sleep and it checks out peaks and valleys in my history. This is also very interesting because post COVID, they did ask us who had these apps, if we were willing to share our data so that they could identify trends in heat in temperature of our body and align it with the data that they were pulling for Stanford. Now, when you see this, this is pretty cutting edge. And this is all about wearable tech. So when I see this, how to stay connected and strong and resilient, it means don't see this as Snapchat, you know, taking snaps and selfies and jumping on Instagram. No, it's actually really using the technology responsibly where it's going to help others instead of just helping yourself because the mental health component of Instagram has definitely been a huge indicator and a huge impact on suicide. You know, so we really have to see the tools we're using and recognize that they could impact us negatively as well if we're not stable, if that makes sense. And stability comes from being able to say, I need help. And yeah. I don't need help from a yoga class because I don't want to go to a therapist. I don't need help from a boyfriend that I want to dump on. No, I need professional help because if we do a personal trainer for the body, a psychotherapist and a mental health professional is a personal trainer for your brain, but it's the one science that we don't look at the brain, the organ. Psychotherapy and psychiatry does not look at the organ. People could have aminos, amino deficits. Um, there could be deficits in dopamine, def deficits in GABA levels, serotonin levels in the brain. So this is really where mental health and the apps coming through I would love to see them really kind of fold that in there and really start to go towards the understanding overall brain health as an organ and then weave it in yeah, to so the I, app, if that makes sense. What you're saying is making mental health mainstream and maybe even being a flow hacker, uh, yes, yeah. do, doing it for all. So uh, I have a question for closing our conversation. Sure. As a flow hacker, what are your top tips to keep balance in moments like this? The simplest way to understand flow 
is to understand that it could be something as simple as when you're in a, in a position where you're bored or something's really bugging you, get up and do 50 jumping jacks. Change the neurological state. Get up and do jumping jacks. Go walk outside, go ride your bike, go yell, go punch your wall, go punch your teddy, go hug your teddy bear. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's about being in action and get out of the, snap out of the neurological state. Anxiety, the first thing they tell you with anxiety is to be able to do that. And I think the most shocking state of flow hacking is I'm not just a flow hacker, but I was also a 9-11 volunteer. So I live with PTSD and you would never guess it. Oh. So there goes the proof that flow hacking, yoga, meditation, your diet, being around community and conscious conversations, uncomfortable ones, being seen and heard, are super vital to the success of most mental health programs. It's not just as simple as saying, here's an app, go do it yourself. It's not gonna work that way. It's gotta be interactive and it has to be with people observing and engaging together as a community. It yeah. just can't be left to the devices of technology and data because it does require input. Yeah, that's why I'm super happy that we have these meetings. Uh, yeah, that's super awesome. And that we can see each other and have the feeling that everybody is is actually in the conversation with the chat. Uh, I like it. I'm, I'm super happy. It's fun. I really want to thank you for sharing. And I think we... Well, no, thank you, you have, for having me and asking the course. questions. <laughs> and you have so many interesting things to say with it. It's only 20 minutes, so we have to continue. So but but I, I, if somebody wants to ask you questions later on, uh, we have a Q&A, so we can... Uh, as that and then I want to hand the word over to Rachel. Thank you, thank you both uh, yeah. and I, I think that it's a topic that we could talk about it for hours uh, and it's a shame that we're not in our usual environment because then after the official presentations we could carry on talking about it for long hours uh, but yeah as we're not in our usual, usual setup and we need to go um, I'd like to uh, first just a comment from Sonia, uh, not a question, a comment, Aim. Uh, but uh, she says that she loves what you're saying and that she just bought a Brave in the Wilderness also. Uh, and for everyone, if you'd like to keep sending the questions, feel free in the end, as Marie said, we will have uh, uh, some time to, to go through them. Uh, and now, Kiona, please. Uh, I will make you present or mute myself, so feel free. So thanks um, for having me here. Um, I work in digital mental health and I've been uh, doing my PhD there for about the last five years, which is why I'm always super excited if uh, someone asks me to talk about digital mental health and the research in the field so far. Um, and I want to start with sort of mental health as your pillar of who you are and how you feel. And if you're affected by a psychological disorder or maybe not a full-blown psychological disorder, but for example, a subclinical, so um, you have this disease burden already and you suffer from the symptoms which can be depending on your disorder, maybe extreme sadness or fear or addiction, which um, can be really distressing. And of course, this also like affects your mood, your emotional regulation skills. Um, and the thing is about having a psychological disorder, especially untreated, also heightens the likelihood to develop another psychological disorder. So you might be burdened with more than um, just one. And of course, this affects your quality of life and it's linked to your physical health and also chronic illnesses and um, disorders are linked very highly. In the direction, it can go both ways, starting out with a chronic illness, but also your um, having a psychological disorder. And then it can affect your self image, sort of your sense of identity, um, your job performance, or your if you're doing education or something else. And, these sometimes are your resources too to kind of deal with stress, but if you can't perform there, can't take part, um, 
this of course uh, can be really limiting. And so not just you are affected, but also your relationships, your family and friends, and generally like your social engagement um, with your surroundings. And we know mental health is a societal challenge we're facing. We were facing it before. Now, due to the current situation, there are the first reports coming out that of course there's a surge in mental health problems and it's expected to grow. And generally the, the prevalence rates of disorders are extremely high. So one, in, one out of 10 is uh, likely to develop a depression in their lifetime and three out of 10 an anxiety disorder. And this is just two disorders and there are many more. And of course you can also develop uh, just the subclinical symptoms like not a full blown, but live with that already. Um, and the longer you wait for treatment, the, the worse it can get too. So it can become chronic and repeat itself and always come back to your life, basically. Um, it is mental health or mental health issues are some of the leading causes for disability. Um, and of course also um, it costs a lot to treat it and there are indirect effects that society sees through this. And we have effective psychological treatments, which exist, um, which are evidence-based, but there are problems why people don't get these treatments. Um, and we have this treatment gap that we know the majority of those who suffer from a mental dis disorder do not receive um, treatment. And if they do receive treatment, it's often like really long times before they seek help. Um, and in this time, again, it becomes chronic and more distressing. And we have different barriers which keep people from actually getting help. And it, it's of course uh, different for every country, but there's some things that are similar. There's something like affordability, depending on if your healthcare covers it or not. Um, if uh, it's available, maybe uh, you live very rural and there are just uh, no mental health professionals in your area. And then a factor which has been emerging, which has also um, become maybe even more important are attitudinal barriers that people think they can deal autonomously with their problems or um, they feel their problems are not severe enough um, so they don't seek help and the good news is that digital mental health options can really address these treatment barriers and reduce this treatment gap and there are many advantages to digital mental health but of course it just becomes more accessible. It's low threshold. People can just go um, and could receive treatment immediately without waiting times. Waiting times is an issue in most countries before people receive treatment. Um, you can participate basically anonymously, although that depends on, of course, who's a carrier, who's providing your mental health service. Um, what's really great about it is it's uh, flexible. You can do it at your own pace and um, you can do it in your own home, in your own home, home setting. And since the like, phones and laptops are so ubiquitous, we see a rise in most countries for smartphones, for internet availability. Um, and we can provide really low threshold uh, interventions to lots of people at the same time. And um, it, would, it could be cost effective also. And the another thing which is really nice about it is the scalability to say if we have this small increase of resources for example do we put a coach behind an intervention or an app is there someone guiding it this can actually really change the effect and um, impacts mental health on a population level um, just for a kind of overview of what we're talking about um, you can kind of categorize it is it like an app is it um, on a smartphone, is it a laptop, computerized? We often talk about internet interventions, which are generally delivered on laptops or computers and app-based interventions, which then come on an app and you can have reminders or prompts, for example. And uh, another important aspect is the human support. So guidance, lots of internet interventions are delivered with guidance, some format of it, and it can range from maybe kind of like automated guidance or automated messages, to um, intense guidance would be, for example, video, tele uh, video chat or telephone. And there was um, this assumption that guidance 
is the key to um, effective interventions, but this is slowly changing. So we're seeing evidence also for unguided interventions or interventions that um, have just kind of automated messages. And most of this guidance is not um, providing new therapy content, but more like motivation, adherence to the intervention to get the people to stick um, with the intervention. Then these interventions have different kind of theory bases. Generally, it's cognitive behavioral therapy, um, where there's lots of evidence for, but we have seen other um, methods too. There's mindfulness or acceptance and commitment therapy, and it's really a branching out to different schools of psychology. And the application areas can be, we can start at prevention, so before a psychological disorder actually develops, or um, it can be actual treatment um, when it's there. It could be after treatment, so maybe we also have some interventions, for example, where people are in hospitals and when they get released, then they receive some kind of digital help. And then there are blended formats, which are you have face-to-face -face therapy, and then maybe some kind of online intervention. Um, the questions we are asking in sort of the scientific questions in general are, of course, are interventions effective? How effective are they? So we generally uh, test these in randomized controlled trials um, and have a controlled group who either receives no treatment or a different type of treatment. And um, then we want to know how long do the effects last? So we always uh, ask people before an intervention starts, after an intervention, and then follow up. And generally follow-ups, if it's long, it's about a year, but of course it would be great to have even longer follow-up periods. We're also trying to find out, is it cost-effective? Is it cheaper to provide digital mental health than maybe traditional services, but also does it cost the same? Or if it's more expensive, is the effect maybe worth it? Um, and then what's kind of coming in new, and there's just not that much uh, evidence on it yet is are there negative effects from using digital mental health? It's a field where um, we're kind of missing evidence even for like traditional psychotherapy. Are there negative effects of um, traditional psychotherapy? But in digital mental health, it's kind of easy to implement and ask people about this. We also want to know is who actually benefits in these interventions and who does not. So are there maybe characteristics that um, speak for who's more likely to benefit so we could in, fut in the future tailor it more to specific populations and are there people who then come and are interested but maybe they should be referred to some kind of different mental health services. Um, and another thing that's kind of happening is we know many interventions are effective but we don't know why. Like it's a big black box and everything gets thrown in that you know about um, sort of psychological interventions, and then the people come out and are better, but we can't really say which part of it. Could we shorten it? Could we have it? Um, and we're trying to figure out um, which parts are really the most essential. For this, though, it has to be different types of studies, really looking at the different single features. And something that uh, we're interested in in general also is like, who is very likely to develop a psychological disorder, especially for Prevention, we, so we don't just provide it to um, universally everyone, but maybe look at are there symptoms, are there indications, is it a certain profile that might predict who is more vulnerable and more likely to develop a psychological disorder. Um, and the data we collect in general is quantitative and qualitative. Qualitative very recently and very limited because we started looking at user experiences, what is it actually like to participate, not just on sort of a numbers level, but asking people how it is, and we're trying to expand that. And quantitative, of course, like symptom improvement, um, also quality of life, um, different psychological disorders, or their diagnostic status. And these, um, this data can be either self-reported by people, or we have clinicians who, for example, call them or see them and ask them to rate um, certain assessments. And uh, very commonly we use web-based assessments because it's easy to distribute online interventions and provide web-based assessments at the same time. But sometimes we have telephone interviews and this is generally the best method is to use web-based and telephone together. So we kind of mix clinician rated and self-report assessments. And of course there's 
Also, this like passive sensing or signal data or intervention usage, the data is there, but I think generally we're not using it enough in the way that we could if we knew how to look at this type of data. And um, so we assess before, kind of after the intervention, and now we're starting to look at in between of the intervention. Um, this could be a mediator and sort of show the effect might be based or due to a, diff a change in something else. Um, and this continuous data, I think it's something that's going to be coming and which we're going to have to use more, but we, we don't use enough. And briefly about data protection, in a scientific field, it's very clear how we protect data. We have very uh, strict standards. We have an ethical board we go to before we have a study. Uh, we talk to the um, data protection officer at the university, and this person has to approve um, everything. And if we use an external platform, they, of course, have to ensure that they're protecting data. But this is only from a scientific perspective. So when there are industries or commercial apps out there, um, they have very, very different standards. And the studies that have looked at that found that there is basically no information on data protection. For many apps that are available. Um, on the evidence of internet interventions, and this is especially those that are provided online, like on a laptop or on a computer, we see that there have been many high quality randomized controlled trials conducted and um, meta analytic evidence. So, there actually now in the past like 10 to 20 years, there have been tons of studies on this. And the good news is there moderate to like large effect sizes for depression, anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, sleep disorder, many, many more, especially also underserved treatments. For, for example, like um, female sexual dysfunction, where there's hardly any other treatment available, there has been um, evidence that internet interventions are useful and effective. Um, and so I think that's really, really good news. And one of the key messages maybe internet interventions um, can be effective and they can be as effective as uh, traditional therapy or traditional psychotherapy. And factors that of course kind of influence how effective something is, is how long was the treatment or the training or the intervention, what content was delivered, how adherent were the people, and this is kind of a problem too, that we know when things are tested in this randomized controlled trial, we have uh, students calling all the time to remind them to take these assessments, of course, that kind of keeps them in uh, the intervention too. Um, and we have seen when we go to the real world and we go to routine care, sometimes this adherence is lower and people just don't take part in the interventions in the same way. So we have to work on that, how to keep that up also outside of this kind of like clinical controlled uh, setting. Then guidance format is important. How much human support um, is provided, what type. And for example, in a different study we just did recently, we found that it's likely the automated messages um, were outperformed human messages. <laughs> and we're going to have to look at this, but there are different assumptions why this might be in it. Because when you have, um, when you were accompanied by someone who was with you, your e-coach, for example, and this person then is not there anymore, maybe you're less likely to continue on your own. That could be one explanation. Um, then, of course, it depends on the disorder type. Like depression and anxiety um, is very treatable. Looking at, for example, substance abuse, um, it depends on uh, what type of substance, of course, but this can be harder to treat, for example. So uh, it cannot be generalized to all disorders in the same manner. And then, of course, it depends on the setting. Is it maybe given a company to something else, uh, to different treatment? Is it a standalone treatment? Um, and that type. Um, this was kind of just the evidence for internet interventions. Talking about apps, this is a little bit different, and we conducted a um, meta-analysis in the last two years and looked at um, evidence for apps that treat mental health. And although we know there are thousands of apps on like well-being and lifestyle out there and hundreds um, for psychological disorders that promise a lot, we only actually found 19 studies with evidence um, for apps. And these 19 studies are not necessarily in the app store either. Um, these were randomized controlled trials, although most of them were quite small and pilot trials. 
And one issue with apps is that um, from an idea to a publication, it takes approximately 18 years. And looking at apps and technology, it moves much faster. So we're going to have to address that in general. And we found small effects for depression and smoking and no effects for anxiety, suicidal ideation, self-injury or alcohol use. Um, but again, these were just a few studies. So um, what we're really seeing is there's a lack of evidence. And we also kind of looked at the components and we could see um, they're not really using unique app features. So if someone is gonna develop an app for mental health, it's really important to use what the, the smartphone or the app is, or the technology is capable of doing, because this kind of indicates that you can't just translate a normal manual into an app and expect it to work the same way. And one of the ideas we had too is you're competing with like social media or some other addictive app on your phone. And we have to find a compelling reason why the person would stick to a mental health app. So the kind of challenges we're facing in general is that there's misinformation on digital mental health. There are these assumptions that people have to be young and super tech savvy, um, or that therapists would find it really terrible to, or feel threatened by it. And what we kind of found out or anecdotal was that therapists just never really saw a digital mental health um, opportunity and don't know how to use them. So there's this lack of communication in this. And, um, looking at our participants we do have older participants the oldest are always around their 80s they when we talk to them on the phone we find out they don't really know what a link is but at the same time they're still using this intervention and they're benefiting from it so that's kind of nice to see the other side of the this is that we do have this missing heterogeneity in data and of course in a global level it's also this diversity missing in data so our average user is female uh, middle-aged, educated, um, and so we're not really reaching everyone. And the question is, is it because it, it's us who's developing it? So we're kind of the same people using it who are developing it. It's generally like young female PhD students in psychology. Um, but also, why are men not using digital mental health? We know in general, it takes more to get, or men generally use mental health services less than women. But um, at the same time, like the disorders are equally distributed um, across genders. And then commercial, commercially available apps, there is a lack of evidence right now for those available and of data protection. And we're missing this communication between the industry and academia. And we have to work on how do we develop things that then are also the industry is interested in putting into their app stores and also that they feel compelled to hold themselves accountable for evidence. We've seen very terrible apps that said something like, you'll heal your depression in no time or something. And it's just at that moment, not true and could be harmful to people. So we have to somehow prevent that. And of course that happens with legislation, but also information to have the public interested in why you want something that's evidence-based. And then just briefly, we know that, um, screen time and mental health is linked and there are more studies coming out with youth especially who spend a lot of time online and there's higher risk for depression and anxiety and we're definitely going to have to address that um, currently i think that these interventions they're like normal uh, psychotherapy also where it's about behavioral activation getting outside um, going and uh, hanging out with friends and family um, lots of this, which um, takes you away from the screen and is just kind of your screen time to use it. And as I said, we're struggling more with the competition with um, apps and other devices than uh, the fear of anyone getting addicted to a mental health app, for example. And my kind of one message uh, to take home is that digital mental health can be effective and very low threshold, um, and it could help destigmatize an approach and help individuals improve their mental health. Okay, so thank you so much, Kiana. I guess that it was quite interesting and the different perspective and uh, what we can do with the technology and mental health. Um, I, Amanda, do you have questions? Or... I actually I have 
so many questions and just so many things I want to throw in there. Um, Kiona, that was absolutely incredible. Thank you so much. So um, I'm sorry, if anyone else does have other questions, please drop them in. But um, I just wanted to say that um, to me, it was really important to have this session because um, the social isolation, quite frankly, has been really difficult for me. And um, the work that you're doing here, Kiona, like looking at all of this information and uh, providing this, um, this digital version of therapy, um, I think it's incredible. I, I think you, you said this in your last slide as well, by lowering the threshold, you know, it makes it easier for people to be able to get help. Like, I think it's, I think it's incredible what you guys are doing. Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, for, are there um, at the moment apps or digital versions of the therapy that you can recommend? Um, or is this purely to do with what you are studying at university or in your, in your research? Um, yeah, I, I mean, we get asked this sometimes and then we realize like, oh, again, we're in our like academic bubble and we're looking at the research and we forget to look what's out there. People are doing that. And there are studies on the apps that are out there and how effective are they? And yeah. there are lots of providers. And I think if someone's looking for help, for example, and looking at the providers, we have to see what do they say about their evidence base. Of course, we have to trust them, but if they're putting out studies and um, are referring to these studies and can kind of back it up, then I think that's better already than those who don't provide any information on it or say the study's being done and, and you can't find anything. So I think we, you could distinguish already which ones are more recommendable at the moment. But how, as a, as a person that doesn't look into this or doesn't know anything about it, how would I know? So for example, um, I keep getting these advertisements for betterhelp.com. And um, I, I mean, I don't know if it's any good. I mean, it looks like it, it looks legit, but how, how do I know? Yeah, I think you're talking about that something that is so topical. Like there is miscommunication in providing how to actually guide and navigate people. And it's not just people in need of help, but it's clinicians out there who have no idea what they could um, actually recommend to someone. So I think we have to work on, there should be guidelines and regulations would make it really easy to, or easier to at least have some kind of standards that apps don't go into the um, app market and advertise false statements. We have this kind of happening in Germany right now with a law change that requires apps to be evidence-based after a year. But of course there's this year where they're out there and they could cause harm. So I think it's, it's relevant, it's open and uh, someone has to do it and kind of work on going out there, public information and providing guidelines and providing uh, help and uh, to navigate through what's actually useful and what might be useful. Okay, uh, we're running a bit late. Uh, so just to finish, there are another, ooh, no, there are two, three questions. I will try to go quickly here. Uh, one, uh, uh, Kiona, is about uh, if there are data-driven uh, ways to, to do diagnose also, or if, you, if it's still something like first you have diagnose and then after you use the, the, uh, the apps or the digital uh, tools. Uh, yeah. And the second one is for you also. So um, it's about uh, studies doing the comparison between uh, the therapy given digitally and the therapy in person. Um, and the third one, da -da 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 -da. okay, uh, for depression and anxiety group, is there a more defined population within those two groups that show more improved for these apps? So for instance, if gender or type of diagnosis, if it influence in the, in the and, and the way that app will kind of uh, act with the person. Um, so yeah, I, I, I will ask everything together because then we can do a unique answer, I guess, uh, and go for our short meditation before closing the session. Okay, uh, thanks for the questions. I'll try uh, to answer their, them uh, together. Um, so about the data-driven diagnostics, there are, for example, now there are chatbots, for example, trying to use trigger words 
and trying to guide people into help. So there's stuff like this happening, but what we're really missing is good predictive models. And that's one reason why we don't have them is because the data that we're not collecting is not that great or it's just not enough. So when we're collecting data and it's like this set of maybe 200 people, if it's a big study, it's 800 and um, there may be three to five depression values, it's just not that defined yet or refined to make really good models. So the goal would be beforehand that people exchange their um, kind of the assessments they're going to plan for, for example, uh, depression and plan this together and have this over lots and lots and lots of studies. So then we can um, have better prediction models. And I think the other problem is that we're not that great at making these prediction models. So people who are really, really good at um, data analysis and know their way around, I think that's what we also need help to um, do what we have this idea, maybe how it could be done, but we have no idea how to do it actually. Um, and so the comparisons on face-to-face uh, -face therapy um, for uh, and uh, digital mental health, looking at the effect sizes, they're, they can, they're very comparable or we have really high effect sizes. Um, but there also have been studies actually there, of course, these studies are stronger if it's in one study comparing actual face-to-face -face therapy directly to a digital mental health um, opportunity. And we have found that they're similarly high um, what they can provide. And it's also maybe a question of who's participating. So are there people who maybe need face-to-face -face or need or are fine with um, digital mental health because they want this also? Because people actively, or a lot of people I have the stigma surrounding mental health. So it's still there, it's, it's very present, and it's hard for people to reach out and get help or go somewhere, call somewhere, and it might be easier just to um, start an uh, internet intervention. And um, to look at these subgroups, we need moderator analysis, and again, we need these very, very um, larger data sets and better prediction to then see who is actually um, benefiting and who is not, because often we're doing this right now, just looking at one single variable, but we know it's like a combination of risk factors and it's gonna be a combination of risk factors at different time points. And for this, it's just not enough to like look at every single one alone and then maybe have kind of a coincidence. And, but looking at these moderators, we did this also, um, there's generally, we can't say, there's nothing we can say that like, um, women or men don't profit. So there's no moderator in that sense, like gender, or age, um, and we also found one of these very typical claims, symptom severity that people say, oh, people who have really like high depression can't benefit from internet interventions. This is not true. Often they can benefit even more, with the only exception is that people who have high suicidality are not accepted into the studies mostly because we can't guarantee that we can um, take care of them, and this is an issue, and we have to address this also because these people are looking for help. We know their waiting times, and it would be much better to take them in and maybe monitor, but for this, we need better systems. How can we provide help if they are in like a crisis? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Kiana. Um, we are way over the time. Thanks everyone that you're still here with us. I guess that the, or the, the two talks are so interesting and the topics are so interesting that uh, yeah, we could say much more. Uh, for everyone following, um, we will send a follow-up after with the record and uh, with the presentation, so Kiona's slides. Um, if you would like to send any other questions, feel free. We can send the questions to Kiona and AIM and they can answer also after. Uh, and now to kind of uh, do the, the end and finalize our session today, I'd like to ask AIM to come back um, and do our final five minutes of meditation. So for everyone, thanks so much for uh, taking part. Uh, questions, feel free to send them. I can see that some questions are still coming in. So feel free to send them. Uh, we can get it and send to Kiona and AIM after. So AIM, now to you, up to you and uh, to cool. the final meditation. <laughs> Okay, so first of all, I wanted to actually thank all of you before we go through this process. Kiona, that was amazing. And thank you so much for taking that, that detailed, really, really powerful approach. And I learned so much from what you shared. And I truly wish you the best to make this succeed simply because it's such a new world that we're stepping into. 
and you were in the cutting edge forefront of this early adoption, right? Amanda was, was chatting about BetterHelp. I've used BetterHelp. There's wonderful things out there that you'll be able to find. Seriously, I have some contacts in my own uh, yoga world that have built apps uh, for women's health in New York City. So ping me a message. I'm happy to connect you with them because I think the key here is about sharing the knowledge and continuously uplifting others with that knowledge and continuously growing the research so that we have a more opportunity to, to help more people. And with that said, let's take a moment to just, um, so now there is something super fascinating. I have actually been practicing yoga since I'm 14 and I've been teaching since I'm 19 and I turn 50 in 22 days, which many people would be shocked by, but the reality of it is controlling the mind and navigating that matter comes from a deep understanding of what your purpose is in life and what it is that really connects you to being you. You as a whole and perfect, complete human being. And that's the part that we all struggle with because the biggest part has to start with self-love. And that self-love is where we end up losing it a bit, disconnecting from it because it can feel super uncomfortable. The connection to mindfulness and meditation, because I've trained corporate, I've trained a lot of people, this isn't my first rodeo, and there'll be another baton of people that will take over when I pass away, right? There'll be another layer. So the key is to always keep on asking the why. Always keep on asking why. Never ever mute your childlike curiosity. Never ever mute it for anyone because that childlike curiosity is what keeps you growing and also keeps you connected to what really matters in life. And it isn't about right or wrong. It isn't about, no, it's not. It's really about connecting to we're all human beings and we all have the same desire to see a better world. We all have the same desire to see a better world for our kids, a better world for our nieces and nephews, a better world for our lovers and our partners and our dogs and our cats, for the environment as a whole. So when you find that comfortable spot where you could begin the process of meditation, you, we can sit. So I'm gonna take you through a very short, very basic meditation that you could do whenever you just feel like you need to just decompress that you just want to unplug, that you just want to kind of close yourself somewhere for a couple of minutes. Meditation does not have to be sitting for an hour. It doesn't, ha it doesn't have any rules. The main science behind meditation from one of my favorite teachers that I've known for 15 years personally is Dr. Joe Dispenza. And it's really about bringing the brain to a low state, taking it down from a high beta, so that like you had shared in your presentation, we could make critical decisions in our life. We could make decisions from a base of rationality, not emotion or reaction. And that's super important at all levels, professionally, personally, with the kids, with the cats, with the dogs, with where we're going on traveling when COVID opens up and lets us go. So take the moment now to come to a comfortable seated position wherever you are. You could, mute the, you could mute all the devices, so you could leave your questions afterwards if you want, but just take a moment to dis disconnect. And that disconnect doesn't mean that you're completely checking out. That means that you're just finding a place to sit with what's uncomfortable, no matter what it is. And close the eyes and become someone that's just an observer of your thoughts. The key to being an observer of your thoughts is put yourself in the director's seat, director seat of your mind. Imagine that you are the director of your own life and you have the opportunity to delete the scenes that don't work. 
and hold on to those scenes that do. So your mind's always gonna keep on moving. It is a monkey mind. The key is to be able to connect and allow it to let go. So as quickly as it comes in, as quickly as it leaves. So with an inhale, you let, and with an exhale, you go. So with every inhalation, you take in the positivity, the prana, the life force. With every exhalation, you release that which doesn't serve your highest and best. With every inhale, you take in more oxygen, more awareness, more kindness and compassion. With every exhale, you take away the judgment, you take away the frustration, you take away anything that doesn't serve the greater good of yourself and those around you. In Sanskrit, it's called Sakshi, the silent witness. You become a silent witness of your thoughts.
slowly bringing back awareness into the mind and back into the room. And just focus on taking a breath in and finding that space. So just feel the difference of when you went in and when you've come out and you clearly could see the difference. And these are where <laughs> we, uh, we connect with it. But yeah, sometimes it could be like the animal or the dog, but the equanimity of balance, the equanimity of balance is what we seek to get. And as a transcendental meditation teacher, it's something that's super important because you can wear multiple hats, you can. The challenge comes on how you pivot between them. And by definition of a flow hacker, it's in essence hacking a flow state, right? Like, you know how like when people hack a computer game, they hack a computer game or a computer to get in, right? So we're hacking states of flow by doing different techniques, whether it's yoga, whether it's running, whether it's uh, playing with your cat or your dog, making the best gluten-free bread ever, making decaf coffee. So it's, it's a very interesting dynamic because all of it is hacking a state of flow because it's doing something that you enjoy, that, that makes you feel excited and loving life. And with that, it propels you forward. It's okay. So thank you so much, Haim, for, welcome. for talking and doing the meditation in, in the end. I guess that it was good, wow. to, good, good wow. end to the day. Yeah. Uh, you guys have energy now. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> There's yeah, now we can enjoy the rest of the day. Well, it's 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 still Friday. <laughs> now so, you can go have some wine. <laughs> oh yeah, we would have some beer or here, more. but uh, we can change. Uh, so thanks everyone again. Thanks uh, for Thank all the you. attendees that uh, stayed here with us today. Yeah. Uh, thanks speakers. Thanks organizers. I hope everyone have a good weekend unfortunately it's not a long weekend again i was enjoying this fact that we we're having a lot of them uh and yeah hope to see you all soon uh if possible in a non-virtual environment but it's also good to see everyone in a virtual environment so thanks everyone and see you then bye bye Thank you. bye bye bye